Welcome. Um, these are really difficult and challenging times for all of us in our country, and we appreciate you taking time out to be with us. We hope this will be helpful to you and the people you serve. You know, impact investing is an increasingly important topic because people don't accept the way they used to, that nonprofits are the best or, or the only way to do good. Many people are suggesting that philanthropy is actually yesterday's news and the future belongs to social entrepreneurs' impact investing in organizing through social media and doing good through market means. We asked you a little bit about this when you were signing up to kind of get a sense of the audience. Here's what we found about, oh, that blue slice there are investment people. Then the orange slice is nonprofit gift planners. Then community foundation staff in gray. Advisors to philanthropists about impact, yellow. And then board or executive director and social entrepreneurs. So it's a very well balanced audience. How familiar are you as a group? Most of you said somewhat. A few are quite familiar and some not at all. What percentage of your clients and donors ask about impact investing? Kind of walking around the pie chart there, starting with the blue, zero to 10%, then the orange, 10 to 25%, the gray, 25 to 50%, and the yellow, 50 to 75%, say that your clients respond that way, and 75 to 100% is the final slice. So how many of you discuss impact investing with donors and clients? Only about 34%. And how many of you discuss it with a community foundation? 28%, that's about 25% of you are community foundation people. <laughs> I don't know what that means. And in the text field, you said, uh, most commonly, we'd like to learn more, need to know the basics, and we want to know a whole conversation about it. So we're gonna start with a 10 minute primer on the terminology, and then I'll turn it over to the panel. I think as a way of setting the tone here, sectors are blurring. If I were to ask you true or false on these three questions, government is supported by taxes. I'm sure you'd say yes, and that's true. Business supported by earned revenue or sales. The answer, of course, to that is yes. And nonprofits are supported by gifts. Now, most of us would say true, but here's the reality. Nonprofits are actually in business too. Most of their revenue, the big blue slice there, 49% is from earned revenue, like tuition for a school or medical procedures performed by a hospital. The second biggest slice is 31.8%. That's government grants, contracts, and reimbursements. Now, a lot of that is Medicare and Medicaid. And then the final slice, 19% of that, some of that is just things like rent, royalties, 14% is the number for philanthropy. So the nonprofit sector is only supported 14% by philanthropy, and the rest really is more like a business. There are new options for donors and doers. Charitable giving, of course, but also impact investing, today's topic, and also increasingly political giving as a way to get change made. Impact investing. You know, on the left-hand side, you have a gift to a nonprofit. And some people would say that's a guaranteed 100% loss as far as the donor is concerned, and it might be a tax savings. On the other extreme, you have investing in a for-profit organization, a company that's trying to maximize profit. But in between, you have these blended things where you might loan money to a charity and get it back at a small interest rate. You might invest in a socially beneficial business, a startup, or you might invest in a company you think is doing good in the world. So it's perceived more as a spectrum today. About five years or six years ago, the Ford Foundation invested $1 billion in impact investing, and that got a lot of people's attention. President Obama came out in favor of it. And I think even more shocking is the Pope came out in favor of it. He's not a well-known <laughs> capitalist, I got to tell you, if you're at his encyclicals. <laughs> so here's some, here's some of the terminology. SRI, socially responsible investing. And traditionally, these are funds where they screen out what are perceived to be the bad stocks, the sin, sin stocks, tobacco, firearms, things like that. That was the earliest player, these socially responsible investments. Now we have ESG, where E stands for environmentally screened, uh, society, impact on society, and G for governance. And these are usually screened in. You try to screen in the good ones. 
Then there's MRI, mission-related investment. And what that basically means is foundations have investments from which they make grants. And the question being raised is, what is the corpus doing? How much good is the corpus doing? So aligning the mission of the organization and the way the money is invested in the endowment is a hot topic. We want to activate the entire corpus is kind of the phrase used there. Then there are PRIs, program-related investments. And if IRS rules are followed, foundations can use these to make high-impact, low-return investments in both for-profits and non-profits. The most typical way that's done is through low-interest loans. So if a nonprofit needs money instead of giving them the money, the foundation could loan it to them at a sub-market rate. There's also a thing called pay-for-success bonds. And basically, I think the easiest way to explain that is with an example. This is ROCA, okay, in Boston. It means rock. ROCA keeps people out of prison. That's why they exist, or they keep them from going back to prison. Every person in prison in Massachusetts costs the government $150,000 a year. So if we can save the government that $150,000, we should get a return on our investment. That's the value proposition. So investors put money into ROCA. ROCA keeps people out of prison. Then the state of Massachusetts pays back the investors to the extent ROCA succeeds with a profit. And Roca is doing pretty well with these. You can see that's 25, 26% last year of where their sources of funds came from, pay for success bonds. Then there's microfinance. In tradition, that means loaning money, often on foreign countries in small amounts to entrepreneurs. So the carpenter can buy the tools, the farmer can buy the seeds, the seamstress can buy the sewing machine, and then you can be repaid at a submarket interest rate. Foundations can also guarantee loans for a nonprofit that wouldn't otherwise qualify for one from a bank. When you look at a lot of the issues today, like food insecurity and so forth, you could invest directly in farmland, you can invest in watershed, you can invest in forestry, wetlands, so you could buy the assets that have an impact on the cause you care about. This whole idea of social entrepreneurship, where we do good in the word, world, not so much by joining a nonprofit or serving on a board or doing something as a volunteer, but starting a, a business for a profit that also does social good. If you want to learn more about that, you might go to the SOCAP, Social Capital Conference, and it's a younger crowd. It's mostly millennials, and it has, definitely has a movement feel. It feels like a mix between a business school meeting and a social movement meeting. A lot of enthusiasm for it there. This will give you an example of the kinds of things that come out of SOCAP. On the left-hand side, you see biolite stoves. So you, you go camping with one of these. You can cook with it, you can warm your tent, and you can also charge your cell phone. Kind of gives you an idea of the market. And the money they make on those goes to subsidize smokeless home cook stoves in countries where the people cook inside, they choke on the smoke, it's very inefficient and polluting. So your for-profit purchase subsidize something that uh, is really for a social, social cause. Now make, how do we make a market in social good? Who holds the measuring stick? Who decides which companies are doing good and how much good they're doing and who's doing the most good? Well, Preston Dodd, one of our panelists, an expert in this, so I'll kind of skip over it, but there are organizations in the business of measuring social impact. Then there are giving platforms that bring together those who need the money and those who have the money without necessarily going through a nonprofit. So this is Kiva. So if your heart is moved by one of the people on this platform who needs money to do something in the world like start a business, you can loan it to them. And when they pay it back, you can do it again and again and again. It becomes a revolving fund. This is donors choose. If you have a teacher in the family, as I do, you know the teachers reach in their own pocket all the time to pay for supplies. If you're moved by that, you can give to a specific classroom, give the teacher what he or she needs to get the job done. So this person is trying to get, you know, a very small amount of money to get carpeting in their classroom and they still need $134 <laughs> crowdfunding. This is change.org. And, you know, what could be more patriotic and, you know, grassroots and signing a petition? Well, they've actually made a business out of posting petitions. 
Change.org is the world's largest petition platform empowering people everywhere to create the plan, create the change they want to see, set up as a business, and look how they've grown. 10 million users in 212, and today 340 users, 340 million users. And look where their money's coming from. A Midier Network, Arian Huffington, Ashton Kutcher, the founders of Twitter, Gates, and others invested 25 million. So it is a thriving business doing social good. How big a market? Well, nobody really knows because you're really not sure how much counts as impact investing, but one estimate is one in every four dollars today is invested with some consideration for sustainability principles. Are there trade-offs? What do I give up by doing this? And you might think that by investing in for businesses who are trying to do social good, you'd be giving up a return. It isn't necessarily so. And Dr. Margaret Towell is an expert. She's written papers on that topic, so I will reserve those comments for her. But it doesn't necessarily come at a cost. Is impact investing, a topic that is important to me, is impact investing going to help or hurt giving? Now, this guy is Wolfgang Haffenmeyer of the European Venture Philanthropy Association. <laughs> I love this quote. He says, if the bulk of investments were to go towards impact investing, then the logical conclusion would be that the field of philanthropy become much smaller, and in theory, there'd be no further need for philanthropy because the uh, impact investments would have solved those challenges. There's certainly growing interest. If you look at the shape of the bars there, 215 versus 217, the blue is people who have impact investing, and the orange are people who are looking into it or would like to have it, up to about 60%, either have it or would like to have it. Does it come at the expense of giving? One, one study said 68% of people who use impact investing do it on top of their existing giving. 19% do it in place of at least some of their giving. And 9% do it in place of all their giving. So I'm going to ask Teresa uh, her, her thoughts on this as well. Does it come at the expense? So imagine trying to answer this objection. This is a donor. First, I give you a thousand bucks. Then the next year, you ask me for another thousand bucks. After 10 years, you ask me to step up to a special gift. Then when you think I'm gonna die, you ask me for a million dollars as my ultimate gift. You know, I think I'd rather invest my money in impact investing, and then after 10 years, I might get all my money back. And besides, the good I do will scale up because once it's in there, the company will grow and grow and grow on its own. And if you're talking about values, if it's good enough for the Pope, it's good enough for me. And I can imagine a, a financial advisor saying, you know, if giving solved anything, it would have by now. With impact investing, my clients are going to do well and also do good. And as your fiduciary, I suggest you hold on to the money and keep it invested with me. So for us all, how will this disrupt the organization you work with and your practice, whatever your seat at the playing table is. If you think of simple SWOT analysis, what are your internal strengths and weaknesses when it comes to impact investing? If you think of the external world, what are the external opportunities you see for your organization or your practice? And what are the threats you see here? So at that point, I'm done with my quick little overview. So we're all on the same page. And let me turn it over to Margaret Towell and ask her what her thoughts are. Thank you, Phil. And thank you for the American College for giving me this opportunity to talk about one of my favorite topics, impact investing. So what I'd like to do is just spend a few minutes setting the, the, the framework, so to speak, for that and talk a little bit about impact investing using my lens. And as Phil mentioned, we all have different perspectives here. And so I, I want to talk a little bit about how I approach it and what I'm doing. I've been in the asset management business for a number of years, and my lens is really one as an asset manager 
institutional consultant and a financial advisor to the uber wealthy. But I also have an economic lens. And so I'm looking at impact investing from the perspective, as Phil was mentioning, of does this make sense for my clients to invest in this? Not necessarily as a substitute for philanthropy, but complementary to that. And I can talk about that a little bit before, I mean, a little bit later. Uh, part of the topic of this talk is disruption. And we all deal with disruption. This is a, actually a timely week to talk about disruption because over the last month or so, we've had a series of disruptions. We've had the COVID-19 disruption. We've had the whole issue of uh, social justice and racial equality in terms of disruption. And, you know, we still have the ongoing disruptions that we're dealing with. And if we look at the external ones, that is an area where impact investing uh, certainly addresses. But from my lens, looking, working with advisors, I've uh, worked with advisors for a number of years. Previously, I was a, a portfolio manager at a large financial institution uh, providing ESG investments for basically retail advisors. So that, that would be the view that I'd look at. And as an advisor, you might look at internal disruption. You've got a lot of technology disruption. You have so-called robo-advisors that may be entering your area, or you've got passive investing. And, and how does this all relate to the idea of impact investing? Well, what I'd like to do is talk about at least what I've seen in the change in the climate for impact investing. And it's, it's funny because a lot of my clients many years ago when they would say, and Phil mentioned SRI, which is basically negative screening, when they would ask me, what, what do you think about that? Should I invest in, in these negative screens? And at that time, speaking strictly as a fiduciary and a financial advisor, not a philanthropist, I would say, well, you know, if you really want to do well, maybe you should make a lot of money and give it away. Because to, to really do well through that vehicle, in my opinion, was not the best way. But what's changed? Uh, since then? Well, a couple of things have changed. One, if we look at the factors that are driving returns, non-financial factors are dominating the market now. 45 years ago, if we looked at the S&P 500, about 83% of the S&P 500 was in what we call tangible assets. And so that might be, uh, you know, your inventory or your real estate or rolling stock, things that you could touch and feel. And that made sense so that the tools that we used to analyze that were tools that analyzed uh, financial assets. But today, the S&P 500, 84% of the value of the S&P 500 is in intangible assets. And what is that? That's your reputation, your brand, your intellectual property. And that makes sense too. If you look at companies uh, that are the Amazon, where the majority of their, their uh, value is not in things that you can touch and feel. So that's one thing that's changed for the world of impact investing. So when we look at impact investing, there are non-financial factors that we're looking at that some people define as environmental, social, or governance, or impact that we need to look at. The second thing that's changed, I think, in the environment and what makes impact investing attractive is this idea of externalities. And if we think of from an economic perspective, which is the lens that I use, if we think of externalities, these are basically uh, some kind of cost or benefit that you incur or you receive as a third party. So let me give you a couple of examples. They can be either positive or negative. Positive might be things like, for example, Starbucks is often a name that's mentioned. I'm from Seattle, so we look at Starbucks. And Starbucks recently, for their employees, uh, said, we'll pay for your college. It makes sense. And why did they do this? Well, one, it reduces turnover. It contributes to the, the positive culture there and a number of other things. So the, these positive externalities are coming through in how the company behaves. But what about negative externalities? Historically, we looked at something like Peabody Coal or a coal company, and we'd say, you know, I, I don't care if they trash the environment, 
what we really care about is, is this company contributing to my shareholder value? But now we see, especially with millennials and, and all investors, but millennials especially, they're looking at that externality. They're saying, no, I don't, I don't like what you're doing to the environment. So they are incorporating that in their valuation of companies. So this has changed and it's very significant. And the, the other thing is that corporations have changed. And so if we look at corporations historically, and as a fiduciary, they would say, well, we just need to respond to shareholders. We need to make money, that's, that's it. But now you've got corporations, someone like Larry Fink at BlackRock coming out and saying, you know what, we need to consider share stakeholders, not just shareholders. And so we're going to combine purpose with profit. Now that is a huge change because finally corporations are coming on to the recognition that impact investing benefits a lot of people, including the corporation, in terms of there's a fair amount of research on it, uh, lower cost of capital, um, higher productivity, higher valuations, fewer bankruptcies, all of these things are results of companies paying attention to some of the non-financial, what we call material or key performance indicators. And, and then the, the other thing is just the world has changed. We talk about disruption in terms of how we look at companies, including companies that are involved in, in doing things that positively impact. And one of this has to do with the data that we look at. As an asset manager, I look at data. Historically, what we called structured data would be from companies, you know, company report or their filings with the SEC and so forth. Structured data is the corporate view. But now investors looking at ESG or impact investing are also incorporating unstructured data. And that are data that are, could be social media. It could be sources that other people don't know. And what are companies, what are investors getting from this unstructured data? And they're using things like artificial intelligence and neuro linguistic programming to kind of mine this data and get some information. What they're getting is company behavior and sentiment regarding companies. So why, why do we want to look at this? Well, there's a whole area of impact investing or ESG investing around so-called controversy risk. If we just look at uh, recent activities, uh, Uber, when they did surge pricing, when all of the people were coming into Kennedy Airport, that was very negative for them. Or CrossFit even recently when a, a tweet was released from CrossFit, that's reputation or controversy risk. And so that makes a difference in terms of how we understand companies and how we understand how they're delivering value to their stakeholders as well as their shareholders. I just wanna spend a couple minutes talking about how we would look at this from the perspective of financial planning. And as Phil mentioned, there's a couple of articles that um, the American College perhaps can make the link available after or, or you can contact me. One of them is on the myths and realities of impact investing, but the other is incorporating impact investing in the financial planning process. And so a couple of things to keep in mind, whether you're an advisor or an investor or a board member, of the things that you might want to look at when you're evaluating, like how effective is my impact investing program or how do I incorporate it in planning? The first thing that Phil mentioned and we talk about that is how does the asset manager or how do you define the universe? Are you going to screen out negative first, you know, for example, cluster bombs or things like that? And then what is the, the screening method there or the theme or the focus that your advisor is using? And then how well is that integrated? And then the second thing is measuring. And I'm not going to get into all of the details of that, but there is a wide variety of different uh, screens. And some of, the, some of them don't even look the same. You might screen a company and it might screen high on one and, and low on another. 
And so what's happened in the industry is a move toward defining standards and identifying materiality. There's an organization called Sustainability Accounting Standards Board that's making really good progress on defining those standards. So um, basically looking at that, just a practical thing from a financial planning perspective, and those of you that are CAPs, and I'm a CAP myself, and Phil certainly helped us understand the whole idea of integrating this in financial planning, but if you're looking at the above the line planning, the, the values and so forth, one of the things I like to do is just present two asset allocation schemes. One of them is with your traditional asset classes and so forth. And the other is more of a behavioral finance perspective in terms of those buckets around, for example, safety and, and the impact investing is under the aspirational risk bucket. And so clients can really see like, where are my assets and how are they positioned? And then the last thing I want to talk about is just what's what's in it for me, so to speak. I mean, we all want to help our clients do the best that they can, but there are a few things that I think make a big difference in why advisors should look at impact investing. The first is it's a differential advantage. You know, there's a lot of concern about robo-advising and passive investing. The studies I've seen show that advisors that bring up impact investing with their clients really have a differential advantage. There was a Barron's article a couple of years ago about how uh, clients really are looking for advisors that understand this space. So that's one thing, differential advantage. And so basically back to the, the idea of disruption, clients are feeling that disruption too. Like, well, where should I invest? What should I do? So you're helping your clients convert that disruption into investment themes by using impact investing. The second is that the greatest source of asset growth for advisors or consultants or others is the existing clients of an asset. It's very similar to the way alternative investments uh, operated a few years ago and that you you know, clients are going to take assets and perhaps give you more. And so this is one source of that. And then the other is it's a way to educate and learn for your clients. Uh, for example, next gen clients can use donor advised funds as kind of training wheels to learn how to invest. So that that's kind of my take on the whole impact investing. Thank you, Mark. It's a great, great uh, comments. Thank you. And Preston, what, what do you see from your seat at the table? Well, um, thank you, Phil, and I'd like to thank the American College and Margaret. It's a great way to start us off, So, uh, as well as the presentation that Phil had provided. So um, for my portion of the conversation, I'm going to focus on uh, just a framework uh, that I'll describe as um, values and the vehicles that we can use to express them and, and as far as uh, financial capital is, involved, is concerned. And from that perspective, um, I will frame some thoughts around ESG. It's a, it's a term, environmental, social, and governance. Uh, and we have seen in terms of um, within the industry, asset flows to a number of funds that are, are describing themselves as ESG. And uh, it builds upon what Phil had, had outlined, but it's um, the, the amount of assets flowing to the sector now into the space has almost quadrupled in the last year or two. And um, although the base was smallish, this has been building for about a decade, and we can go back several decades as to how it all got underway. Uh, originally, it was more divestment oriented. We didn't want to be in certain types of stocks or what may be perceived as uh, um, uh, negative screens, and we don't want to invest in those. Now it's getting to be to the point of how do the environmental impacts and societal impacts and governance governance impacts of these corporations affect our society. There are, uh, so there's momentum and attention to that. And I think for purposes of our conversation today in the audience, it's something that we'll be, I think, increasingly aware of, um, but also in terms of those vehicles to express those values, it is uh, very much a work in progress still. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So for purposes of, um, and talked a little bit about the asset flows, and um, this idea that I think, and, and more recently as well, uh, around climate initiatives in the last few years uh, with the Paris Accords in 2015, especially 
um, a growing awareness around some of the impact of fossil fuels, but also maybe the indirect impact there. So not ne necessarily just uh, avoiding certain types of companies, but thinking about the energy use of all companies and how that will impact. And so those are types of questions, especially from certain types of investors that I think we'll, we are getting more often and will continue to get more often. I think along those lines as well, um, if we then think about um, what Margaret had alluded to um, a decade or two ago or more, um, there was a very real um, perception and, and a reality if you're fiduciary and you were providing advice to a client that is in their best interests, um, what level of conviction, if any, could you have about saying that um, you can do this, of course, but uh, it may be a concessionary uh, type of investment structure where you have to give up a little bit of a return. And more recent research is indicating uh, Michael Porter and some of his colleagues out of Harvard um, beginning in, well, there was an article last year around ESG and then uh, the initial um, research came out in late 2016, 17, that's starting to show that there can be outperformance. And in some ways it's common sense. If your uh, company is doing things from a governance perspective uh, and environmental perspective and using resources more efficiently, then yeah, that, that can make sense. Now, now we're starting to see academic research to support this. Now the challenge becomes, um, in terms of those factors, uh, what is material, what needs to be disclosed to investors, and what information can those investors use uh, that the companies have disclosed to understand who, which of the companies and industries may outperform relative to other investments. So therein lies the challenge, and I think what, we're, what we are seeing and will see in the coming years is an effort to try to make sense of this in a, an analogy that, uh, I'll date myself a bit, but the standards around uh, videos or the standards around uh, what is going to be the platform that we use as reference. And so from the perspective of uh, climate, as an example, there is a, a large initiative underway um, and Margaret uh, alluded to one of the players in this before, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. We also have the Integrated International Integrated Reporting Council. International Accounting Standards Board, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, Climate Disclosure Standards Board, that are all coming together, that are seeing slightly different, uh, using slightly different lenses for their reporting. And there's an initiative underway by the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures to try to make it all one language and or translate it so that it can be used by investors and we can disclose and understand the same um, materiality around the impact that these companies are having, then investors can use this information. So on the good news front, there is increasing evidence that um, these factors can provide outperformance for companies, for those investors that are interested in making a positive impact through their um, traditional investments, this is a way to do it, um, but it is still a work in progress. And I, I think I'll, and I'm, I'm gonna close with this and just in some in framing, it's not one size fits all, it's not binary. And I think from the perspective of the role of philanthropy, the role of impact investing, and then the role of traditional assets in those vehicles that we we'll use to express our values, I believe these are the types of questions that we will be helping our clients navigate and understand about how they express those values. And, and it will continue, I am uh, in fervent disagreement that philanthropy will go away. I think it will continue to be important. I think it will, um, continue to be a critical way for um, our clients to express their values. But I also think that um, the siloed or, or separate approaches that have happened in the past, where if someone's making uh, money and perhaps giving it away, I think there's going to be increasing attention to how those relate to one another and what, you know, what that may mean um, so that they are better aligned. And I think those are the types of questions that we will be helping clients uh, navigate in, uh, in the coming years. Thank you, Preston. That's very helpful. Thanks a lot. Uh, Teresa's perspective is a little bit different. She's more our nonprofit person, which I think is going to be refreshing because you're looking at it from the standpoint of people who normally receive money from um, gifts. Well, what has been your experience? How is being taken up in the nonprofit sector, Teresa? Uh, I'm an honored to be a part of this discussion. It's exciting and it's great to be able to bring a new light to this. Um, uh, the I think the nonprofit community it has the same excitement and um, um, 
hesitancy to go all in with impact investing that we see across the field, but increasingly it's something that is wildly compelling to the donors that support nonprofits. And when um, nonprofit leaders, and that includes, I'm including their um, uh, staff, and, uh, executive staff certainly, uh, uh, volunteers, m boards of directors, and certainly foundation um, uh, participants, uh, when they really come to understand that impact investing can help really be a tool of their mission versus um, an area they have to respond to that's coming externally, I think when they really integrate it into how they approach uh, all the work that they do, that's when you see just real unbridled enthusiasm. And you really look at, you know, when we look at nonprofits that have significant reserves, and um, we're really asking the questions, they're asking the questions, how can all the areas that I am trying to change in the world in my mission, how are those expressed in how I am, my, the, the reserves of my organization are invested? And I think about um, a community foundation in Minneapolis called In Faith Community Foundation that has a portion of their assets screened so as to undermine the um, gender-based violence. So they're really taking an active approach on how they're per pursuing change with their assets. And then when we come to how, what is its impact, the question you posed earliest in the conversation, what is the uh, downstream impact of impact investing on uh, charitable giving to nonprofits? I think the research uh, on fundraising definitely supports the idea that the more conversations around impact and outcome, the greater the giving. There's not some like small pie of money. And if you start to push um, a, a lot of that to impact investing, there'll be a smaller amount left over for philanthropy. I, I, I agree certainly with Preston and probably all of us on this call that um, the philanthropy actually and the approach of philanthropy is perhaps more important than ever in conversations around impact investing, because this is the, I mean, our chosen area as CAPS or um, and anyone on the call who's at a foundation or at a nonprofit, that's long been our area of expertise to really, and this is one of my main points I'd like to leave today with, um, we have always had um, as our really, the way we do business to have conversations about values with folks, to have that meaningful relationship and being able to uh, partner with financial advisors, you're really helping to strengthen that bond between uh, you, your donor and my client or my donor and your client being able to really meaningfully engage on these topics that are closest to the hearts of clients and donors. That's really a skill that to have a great partnership with your local uh, community foundation, to have a great partnership with the nonprofits that are serving these needs, that millennials. It's, it is a tremendous way to actualize discussions of impact and bring that in to how you approach these issues with your clients and donors. And in that way, conversations around impact and impact investing really are um, incredible tools to attract and retain clients and from the nonprofits perspective attract and retain philanthropic supporters and so everyone really gets to achieve their mission by having more meaningful um, conversations around impact whether that's impact investing of the assets they hold in their portfolio or the impacts of their gifts that they give to a nonprofit, being able to really clearly articulate the change that has happened as a result of any gift that you've given, that's highly in alignment with um, the ways that the sort of the lens and the rigor that we've seen in the mm, financial sector, when we bring that to the nonprofit sector, you really get a win-win. We understand more about how assets are being used and we understand more clearly how change is going to occur as a result of our investments and our gifts. So that together we really, um, we can really start to plan, fund, and 
prove all the change we'd like to see in the world. Fantastic. Thank That's you. all I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you for that clarion call. Yeah, you know, well, the, the lines are open in terms of the chat. If you have a question, you might start typing them in. I, I've, you know, every time we get around this topic, there's so many things that occur to me and other people. So ty type your questions and we can pivot into those. I'll ask another one. Um, you know, I'm thinking about some of the people who are on the call. We're basically asking, how do we get into this conversation with clients and donors? How is this a different conversation than it normally would be either in fundraising on the one hand or in investing on the other? How do you even... Uh, redefine your role or your relationship around having a different kind of conversation? How might you start a different conversation if you haven't done this before? <laughs> Do you have any thoughts, Preston, how you would, you know, because you're an investment person. Now you've been around a lot of investment people. You know, you know how analytical a lot of that is, how numbers driven. How, how, do, how, how do you redefine yourself? I also know that uh, speaking of externalities, uh, sometimes uh, <laughs> depending on uh, the year, uh, 2008, 9, 10, uh, there's very different types of conversations than maybe 2015. So from the perspective of what's happening in the markets, uh, sometimes that will dictate the tone of a, of a client meeting or a, a conversation. But I think in, 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 to that point, um, what won't change typically is uh, the values that the clients have and, and the work that you're doing with them to help plan uh, for might, might be a college uh, uh, savings plan. It may be their retirement plan, but it also um, uh, time and time again, the conversations about uh, the impact that a client wanted to make, what did they care about in terms of the other um, organizations with which they were involved. Usually that opened up a lot of insights about the client, about their families and about what they valued. And I think from that perspective, it could be a great way to, um, as much as, as we can get away from the, the externalities of the market and to some degree we can't. On the other hand, I think it can help serve as sort of a, a North Star that it's not this week or this quarter, what we're working for is retirement or we're working to help an organization that you truly care about it has been around for years and will be around for years. College retirement, though, college, those types of things that I think can help frame this in ways that also align to values and it can be a, a, a nice reassuring space to return to in every meeting. Thank you, Margaret. I mean, you're a portfolio manager. How do you talk, to, how do you introduce people to the idea of thinking about their values or thinking about their investments? Is it is like right and left brain or? <laughs> you know, I think that's an excellent question. And it's funny, I'll, I'll tell you a little story that happened to me that really changed the way I approached the whole thing. In working with one of my clients a few years ago, and this was an extremely wealthy individual, and he was doing a lot of philanthropy and, and investing in a lot of different places. And he just seemed so frustrated. And so I just said to him, I said, you know, Robert, what do you really want to do? What, what do you really want to do with your wealth? And so the point is to just ask the question. I know at the American College and some of what you've done, Phil, from success to significance, you know, people are looking for how to make that transition. And a lot of times people don't ask. There's a survey that, uh, that was conducted with financial advisors and they asked the advisors, what, what, what do you think about impact investing with your clients? And the advisors majority said, my clients aren't interested. Then they asked the clients, you know, have you had conversations with your advisor? And 63% of the clients said it was client initiated. So I think the first thing is to just ask. And then the other thing I found really useful in having those conversations, since I'm not a psychologist, and, and as Preston was saying, you know, we're usually used to dealing with the market, is to use some of the tools of emotional intelligence. I know that there are uh, you know, an individual named Colleen Stanley has written a book on emotional intelligence in the sales process. And it, it just makes sense. If, and that's the role of the advisor anyway, to mm -hmm. be empathetic and to help people achieve what they want. And so I, that's what I've found to be successful for me. You define the role of the advisor as being empathetic. I think that's kind of a... <laughs> aspirational goal maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but, but. Well, I think to speak to that question from the nonprofit perspective, I think 
our discussions in philanthropy, when we are um, re representing a single issue charity, we aren't usually talking about the full scope of someone's assets. But then when you get to the um, gift planning stage with someone, um, it's very rare that you are not in conversation with someone that's handling their assets in some way. Mm -hmm. And, um, if, if, and if, if you're doing it right, you for sure are in conversation with those, in, th those folks. And you really want to be able to add value to that conversation with the, the, as a, a cap or a fundraiser. And to do that, you really have to understand the values that are driving the total portfolio, the philanthropic giving, and how they're handling their assets overall. Mm -hmm. And when I think about further how you are really thinking, you know, earlier on, Phil, you brought up SOCAP, and I think about the ways that these conversations mm -hmm. have played out when I think of um, Morgan Simon's work with the um, professional athlete Derek Morgan, and he was an individual African-American who had been doing a lot of community work. I put his link in the chat there to a discussion that they did on the stage at SOCAP. And he was doing a lot of philanthropy, really active, and then later on found out that his assets were working completely counter to all you know his most closest held values. And we certainly wanna be in line with our clients, really their as a, a financial advisor and a, a cap, you want to be able to help folks get to that alignment um, so they can have that impact in their lives overall. It's been very helpful. And we're getting some lively uh, conversations going here in the chat. I think one of the questions people have is really, at what level of assets is this a live conversation? Is this for organizations with endowments of 100 million or 5 million, 10 million, and how about individuals? Is this coming down to the retail market or is this strictly, you know, many of you are from the high end of the market and how far down market does this come? The, how far down, you mean in terms in of- In terms of net worth and- Right, I, I think that's a really assets. good, yeah, question. I mean, a few years ago, you might have a very high amount, but what's happened is the, the financial services industry has really jumped on board and there are many ways to implement these strategies you know, consistent with values, including uh, ETFs and um, mutual funds, separately managed accounts, thematic investing. And so I, I think what's happened is the financial services industry has recognized that there's a demand here. And so I'd say even in the last two years, it's really proliferated. What are you What are you seeing, um, Preston? Do you, Do you think it's that there's a supply of appropriate product for the retail investor or the retail investment uh, sales? Or yes, and I think it's a great question. And and to um, sort of um, take Margaret's point a, a bit further, and a, and also a comment that I made earlier, we're seeing a lot of um, asset flows to funds that are um, self-described or have some uh, suggestion of ESG or or um, broader impact in their fund title. And uh, I think version, we can debate what version this will be, but version two or three of, of this particular time, I think is gonna be a, a deeper, more transparent look as to what's actually in there. Mm -hmm. But I think to answer this immediate question, uh, we are seeing we, we've a quadrupling of the number of funds in the last year or two. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, I've got a great comment here that I will throw out to the panel. This is from a friend. I won't mention her name. But <laughs> I appreciate her energy here. Okay. I, I, I trust the panel enough to be able to react to this. At least, at least uh, watch your faces. But what she says is, you know, impact investing has proliferated. So is greenwashing. Any comments? Right. And that's kind of where I was going. So I think the transparency, will be next. what's truly in there. So the index funds, I think the financial service industry has recognized it and they've recognized the demand. Right now, we might not know truly if it's a bumper sticker or if it's really there. And I think that's going to be the next, uh, uh, the next stage of version, we'll call it three, of mm -hmm. truly understanding what's there, what's greenwashing and what's making an impact. But I think with this research and the standards that are now maturing, um, because some of these standards boards didn't even exist. I, I attended Gene Rogers, the founder of SASB, 
And there was a small conversation around 2009, 2010, about a decade later, we're now to the point of maturity that I think some of these standards can start to be applied and that will help um, better differentiate among what is marketing and what is uh, truly um, uh, material to these efforts. Now, these are these are good responses, and I appreciate the questions too. Here's, here's another friend who's, who's writing and giving us some suggestions on open the conversation. I think they're helpful. Uh, what, what's your objective in your investing, and are those objectives strictly financial? Uh, how do you know you're successful in your investing? Is it all about you know more for you? How do you want to use your wealth? I think those are, those are good comments. Those are so uh, you know uh, to what we say is caps. Mm -hmm. one, one of just to respond to that phil just in in a quick thing i i think i it's not either or you know they're both and one of the things that i found especially useful is uh to ask clients um what is their theory of change or you know um what's their mantra and th and then you can get an idea of that and so I mean, that's the great thing about uh, what's happened recently is that these disruptive issues that we talked about, people are figuring out ways to invest in them. And I think Preston's point is, is an excellent one. There is no paragon of ESG or impact investing for a company. And that's where materiality comes in. And so you can still have your values and then the, the company is going to fulfill those to some extent, but never 100%. Mm -hmm. That's another and question. Earlier, Preston, oh, I'm so sorry, Phil. No, no, earlier, no, no. Preston made the comment that's not, an, um, uh, it was non-binary, and I think that applies mm -hmm. to so many aspects of this conversation today. The, the positive change is not coming, it's not coming from nonprofits, and then on the other side you have for profits, I think we're seeing great change everywhere. And then when we talk about values, we're seeing that philanthropy and in traditional finance. It's all, and it's really about the type and tenor of conversation you're having with who's in front of you. Yeah, thank you. Got, we've got one specific question here, which might be a way to uh, first define what a B Corp is and ask why, why somebody might want to be one. Uh, essentially, a B Corporation is a company that's been certified by B Labs as having a number of criteria that oriented to social good and also put some uh, roadblocks in the way of selling the business out, selling the business, selling out the values. You have to stay a B Corporation, have to stay oriented. What would be the advantages to a company uh, in becoming a B Corporation? There's going to be a certain amount of restrictions that go with a certain amount of hassle in getting it. Who, who might want to set up as a B Corporation and what would be the advantages to them of doing it? I'd be happy to feel that. I um, uh, just recently um, ended a tenure of serving on the board of a B Corp, the Impact Hub here in Seattle. And um, uh, I think the perception is, I think the perception was very important to stand for the mission of what B Corp is, to blend um, social and financial return and to help all of us learn how to have those conversations more articulately as these fields bl uh, blur, merge, and, they, and therefore um, strengthen our ability to achieve both, you know, not just to have conversations, but achieve those. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important part. So there has to be a commitment to really pulling both of those threads at the same time and not one or the other. That's a reason to do the B Corp because it, it um, mandates that you do that. Right. And secondly, um, I think there's a growing interest in folks and understanding that in the investment sector, like Margaret has emphasized, um, it's really an important value add, a, a, a key, key area of the sector that's only gonna grow. So to be er early in on that is important. It is a lot of work um, to uh, create and maintain. Uh, so, yeah, I think it really it ha it depends on where you're at as an organization, whether it's right fit for you. But it's certainly important. It kind of addresses a greenwashing topic too, right? That it's a, somebody yeah. has certified you as being the real deal. We've only got a few minutes left. Is there any uh, kind of final comments or things that are sticking out that, have, that should have been said and haven't been said now that we've had a little bit of a conversation? Any closing thoughts? 
Uh, I'll, gi I'll give just a couple. I mean, one, this is just a taste of it, and there's a lot of different viewpoints here. And I think speaking from my lens for financial advisors, the best way to approach this, since it covers all asset classes in all areas, is just pick an area that's consistent with you know, your core competency and then work on that with your clients. And, th and then, you know, it'll go from there. I'll just add on to that and say, if there is an area that's not your core competence that you think is really important to be able to provide to your clients, partner with your um, uh, philanthropic advisors out there and specifically your community foundations. They do have this expertise. They probably know the important um, actors in that field and they're trained in how to have these kind of conversations. I guess in the field, just a closing thought. So I, I'm appreciative of everyone being on today and, and again, of the American College and, and Phil for putting this together. And then also I think that uh, given what's, um, what's happening, these are questions uh, that, that um, I thank everybody for attending today. And I, I have a feeling that these will be questions clients will be asking in the summer and fall as, um, uh, and, and forward. And so these will, this is time well spent um, because I think this is a, uh, I don't want to say if it's tip of an iceberg that's been happening for decades, but I do think that there's momentum here and I think increased awareness uh, around uh, a lot of the roles of, of companies and corporations and nonprofits, and community foundations, and how we're all um, aligning for uh, the impacts within our communities. Yeah, I guess, I guess the, thing, the kind of thought occurs to me is that I think we, we have been trained in such a way that our professional selves and our personal selves are somewhat separate. Mm -hmm. And it feels a little awkward venturing into personal territory on company time. You really don't know if you're allowed to, if there's some kind of compliance <laughs> prohibition, you know, small talk for two minutes after that, it's business. But in that zone between, you know, what's the weather like and how are things going? Gosh, how do you keep the hurting in the world out of the conversation these days. The world is hurting so much. Mm -hmm. If you can let it into your professional life and then look for solutions within the tools available to you, it feels to me like there's, it's almost a necessary thing that we almost all have to get a little more comfortable with that, even though it may seem awkward at first because the, the need is there and our clients are hurting because of that need as well. They feel it themselves. So I think, you know, I really appreciate having a chance to, to do this with all of you and appreciate so many people who showed up and, and, the, and the great questions. But thank you all for being here and for joining us. It's been a great pleasure to do this. And thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.